Welcome back. We're going to continue here with some of the consequences of these uh, wars of religion. I mentioned we were going to talk about the rise of Prussia and uh, Austria. So let's, uh, let's, let's dig into this for a moment. You remember that the Treaty of Westphalia confirmed the imperial government's the inability uh, to enforce orders, uh, to, uh, to pass laws that are followed, to raise taxes, uh, to conduct a coherent foreign policy. Uh, and again, when I say the empire, I'm, I'm referring to the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, you remember that sovereignty could be found only at the local level. And in the Holy Roman Empire, there are 300 princely states, each sovereign. Uh, of course, armies and courts cost money, which the imperial princes collected through a variety of crude taxes, excise taxes, tariffs, river tolls. Now, think about this for a moment. Here you have all these different principalities in the Holy Roman Empire, each exercising their own sovereignty and each exercising um, uh, their own religious choices, as well as imposing impediments to commerce by collecting taxes and tariffs. This, of course, is going to slow down trade and, um, and slow down the development here in the empire. For instance, a cargo shipped 400 miles down the Rhine from Basel to Cologne had to pass through 30 political jurisdictions and was subject to so many tariffs that the, the whole endeavor was impractical. Now, because of the handicaps imposed upon business, German towns suffered continuing losses in population, in wealth, and importance. Uh, with the empire sort of a hollow facade, Interest focuses on several German states which were large enough after 1648, and remember 1648 is the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, a couple of these states are going to emerge uh, and they're going to be able to function in this international power structure in Europe. And of course I'm talking about Austria to the south and Prussia uh, to the north. Both of these states will begin to develop uh, vigorously in the second half of the 17th century. Uh, Austria is run by the Habsburg family, the Habsburg uh, dynasty, the Hohenzollerns will, are the dynasty that operates and runs Prussia. Uh, both of these uh, territories, both Prussia and Austria, are sort of on the periphery of the Holy Roman Empire. And in the 17th century, both of these states faced east and uh, sort of built themselves up at the expense of the Ottoman Turks. Uh, down in the Balkans and southeastern Europe. Uh, they built themselves up at the expense of Poland uh, in eastern Europe and uh, at the expense of Sweden. Now the Habsburgs uh, spoke, uh, within the Habsburg Empire, you have uh, just a variety of languages, uh, Slavic languages, uh, Germanic languages, uh, even Magyar, which of course is Hungarian and doesn't share cognates with any of these other languages. Uh, and you have a variety of religious creeds, including Muslim and uh, Orthodox, uh, Christian Orthodoxy, uh, the Catholicism, Protestantism. So no part of Europe was more heterogeneous uh, ethnically and culturally than these Habsburg domains. Now, although these Habsburg territories were physically uh, uh, adjacent to one another, their people shared little except the accident of living near one another. Um, so you're going to have to create nationalism in a place uh, like this where the Habsburgs rule because you have so many different language groups, so many different religious groups. Now, this, and this is a subject of historical uh, debate, uh, the Habsburgs did not want to weld these diverse peoples into a single political unit equivalent to say France or England. Instead, they preferred to play one group off of another, the old idea of uh, divide and conquer and, and to rule in this fashion. Uh, the key figure here is uh, Frederick William uh, from 1640 to 1688. He's known as the Great Elector. Uh, his basic decision was to create a, a permanent standing army uh, to enforce the rule of the Hohenzollern family and uh, to make Prussia uh, predominant. So all of his social, political, economic innovations stemmed from the centrality of the army's role in creating this Hohenzollern or Prussian state. Now in 1653, uh, the elector worked out a compromise with the various nobility. 
whereby he recognized the special economic and social privileges of the Yonker class, that's J-U-N-K-E-R, uh, this uh, Yonker class of landlords and uh, landed nobility. Uh, he recognized their special privileges in return for what turned out to be sort of a permanent tax to maintain this Prussian army. Uh, the elector's army gave him and his heirs absolute political control. Uh, it encouraged the people in the habits of discipline and obedience. It contributed to the unity of the state. Uh, for peasants from all the Hohenzollern provinces were recruited into the rank and file of the army, while the Yonkers, the uh, wealthy landed classes, uh, staffed the officer corps. So you have, a, you have Prussia. It uh, sometimes uh, makes you wonder what comes first, Prussia the society or Prussia the army. Uh, they seem sometimes to be one and the same. I'll continue. The great elector had worked to make his state homogeneous, that is, the same all over. Uh, of course, the Habsburgs cultivated uh, diversity or heterogeneity. Uh, I'm not even going to try the word. It's too difficult now. Uh, but while the Habsburgs encouraged diversity in their empire, uh, the Hohenzollerns are seeking um, a homogeneous state. Um, Prussia was more militaristic, more bureaucratic than the, uh, the Habsburgs. Uh, Austria could not uh, extract from its subjects as much money or service as could the Prussians. And again, this may have to do with the fact that Austria the Habsburg rule, uh, the Habsburg domains are very diverse, uh, whereby the Prussian domains are very homogeneous. Uh, the Austrian population is much larger, uh, but nevertheless, uh, Prussia will rapidly catch up and pass Austria uh, in diplomatic and political power. Remember that Prussia is Protestant, Austria is Catholic, uh, the two states gradually turned into strategic rivals because both were headed by German dynasties and both hoped to expand their domains westward. In the 18th century, Prussia and Austria would quarrel bitterly for the leadership of Central Europe. And in the 19th century, they would fight for control of Germany. And indeed, uh, as we'll talk about later, uh, the Prussian uh, prime minister, Otto von Bismarck will conduct a series of wars here in Central Europe, one against Austria itself, to create the modern state of Germany. And you'll notice that the Germany created by Bismarck, when we get there, um, uh, historians call this uh, the creation of a Kleindeutsch, Kleindeutsch, which is a small Germany, uh, that does not include Austria. Uh, Bismarck deliberately excluded Austria, did not seek to incorporate Southern Catholic Austria into the German Empire. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, will have consequences when we get to the uh, 19th and, uh, and 20th centuries, but we'll get to that down the road. Uh, thanks for your attention.